check, 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 check. All right, welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z. And I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery. And God, we are terrible. Wow, we can redo that oh, again. Oh, dude, that was like straight up 1980s FM radio. That was... And we're back! And we're back! And we are back for the last episode of 2020. Are you ready for this, Ian? Yeah, why are we remote? Uh, well, I have this new visitor in the house. Um, she's a dear friend of ours. Uh, she decided to come into our lives at the last second. And um, uh, little Miss Rona has uh, extended her stay through the whole family. And uh, so we're just playing it safe and making sure that uh, you and your family stay safe uh, at the end of the year here. Everybody feeling okay, though? Yeah, we did pretty good. Um, you know, we had the, the normal symptoms of... Um, getting the chills and feeling weak. Um, I actually had an episode. I felt perfectly fine, but I woke up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and ended up passing out on the bathroom floor. Uh, That was pretty trippy. Um, And uh, so did my brother. My brother had the same issue. But um, as far as the family goes, you know, we all had, you know, a fever for a couple days and then that was about it. No one was throwing up. No one was, you know, having any hard times. It was just feeling miserable for two weeks. But uh, yeah, we're over it. We feel good. I'm glad you're on the mend. Yeah, we're, uh, I mean, for all intents and purposes, we're, we're all fine. And we went out sledding with the kids yesterday and, um, just doing a, doing what we can to make sure that we're not someone else's excuse for getting sick. So, um, so this is the last, uh, episode of this, of the year, 2020 finally coming to an end. It, uh, seems like it took forever, but at the same time, I don't, I feel like it went by really fast too. Well, it'll be nice to get back together anyway. I've got this, uh, this new full throttle Ooh, hoodie. Swag, huh? Yeah, I've, I've got one with your name written all over it. I can't have my little prize show pony rocking throwback swag. So. <laughs> cool. Well, um, you know, maybe in 21, we can uh, actually go to a few more events that we did this year and actually hit a circuit strong. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm, there's a few things in my life that I'm relatively good at. Um, but there's one thing in my life that I'm the best of all time at. I am the greatest of all time at getting free hoodies. Ask anybody. <laughs> like, I go to a show, I will walk out of there with three to five free hoodies. It's well, a talent that I think I could probably pass on. I think you just warned the whole show circuit for next year uh, to watch out. Yeah, follow Ian around, get free hoodies. <laughs> So uh, last show of the year, we wanted to take a retrospective and look back. Uh, We did this last year looking at the industry and how it evolved over the year um, and kind of hit some key points of things that were, um, you know, big, big changes for our industry and what we do. Uh, and so we got a whole list here to, to run through, but uh, we won't spend too much time on the individual topics unless they're, um, you know, bigger uh, topics in, in general. But, um, you know, in January... Uh, you know, we started off the year with King of Hammers, right? And uh, King of Hammers is always a good time. It's always got a lot of fun uh, events to follow and and be, um, you know, following online and social media, or unless you're there at the at the actual show. But uh, this year was a big uh, big deal because Can Am for the first time ever swept the podiums. Um, Miller, Cheney, and Burton uh, Blurton uh, took took top spots, and uh, it was the first time ever that I think first time Can Am was on top. And the first time that they've ever swept the podium at Hammers. Yeah, it was definitely the first time they got they they won it. But I, I, one of the most impressive results I saw on that entire trip, and it's not just because, you know, I try not, I try to be objective and I try not to be a honk. But uh, we had a team member, Jason Weller, start in 88th and finish eighth, and he did that on the new X3 RC platform right. with. Uh, you know, a lot of in-house tuning. It, it was an impressive, impressive finish. No question about it. And that and that kind of kicked off a full year of uh, Can Am really dominating um, the race scene. And not necessarily like they won every event, but that they were a bigger presence than they've ever been before. Um, they really kind of uh, hammered down and, and invested in their athletes. 
and uh, really decided to um, show strong in 2020. Unfortunately, a lot of those races got canceled because of Rona, but um, they, they definitely made their presence known this year. And I think it'll be interesting going into 21, you know, with uh, Polaris and all them getting back into the game, possibly with a new car, things like that. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see what 21 turns out for the racing and how they all adapt to losing like the Lucas series and things like that. Um, but uh, the showing at the beginning of the year and the investment into converting a lot of those athletes over to the Can-Am team uh, was pretty impressive and a uh, big shout out to their team. It feels like uh, the coronavirus is going to be a factor at least through the first quarter of 21 as well. I don't know if you noticed this, but the Supercross schedule just dropped for 2021. And it is primarily states that are friendly to hosting events through the pandemic. You know, I want to say uh, it was predominantly like Texas, Florida, Utah, uh, Georgia, if I remember right. If there, I think there was a Georgia event in there. But it looked like they were going to be hosting anywhere from two to three races over the course of a co- you know a week or two at some of those locations. It it just you know it doesn't necessarily feel like it's it, it's forced, but you know, they're definitely adamant about finishing the season off, but coronavirus still is going to have its say in 21. And it, it could very well be the first quarter, or second quarter of 2022, where this more or less we've adapted to it. Right. Is uh, I, I saw the schedule come out, but I didn't really look at the locations. Um, are they keeping it into the arenas or are they going to start migrating outside more? Um. I didn't see where it said the arenas. You know, when I see Nevada, I assume it's Sam Boyd Stadium. I know there's an event at Daytona, uh, Orlando. I'm not sure where they would host that one. Salt Lake, I know, is in, I think it's in the soccer arena. And uh, Arlington, I mean, that might be Cowboy Stadium. I'm pretty sure it is, but I'm pretty sure it's all indoor for sure. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see. You know, uh, Rona's going to be a big thing through 21, I think. I think it's not going to go away until, um, you know, the majority of people have done vaccinations and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think the industry in general is going to be hot to make sure that these races go off and these events go off. So uh, it'll be interesting and it'll be important for us as a community to partake in it correctly and, and be participating in the efforts to keep these things going. Because if we're uh, at the shows with our masks off or if we're not following the rules, you know, that's just going to get our events shut down and, and make the counties less pliable when we go to apply for these events. That's definitely a reality, and it's definitely something that we're going to be dealing with, uh, whether it be side-by-side guys or whether it be business. I've used the term, that, you know, I've said that this virus rewards the creative, and I think that's going to be a reality for at least another 18 to 24 months. What happens with the event series is going to determine what our schedule looks like, ours being yours and mine, obviously. But I I do think that you and I are going to have a very, very busy year, regardless of what restrictions might be put on or what's going on with this virus. I think that uh, we've got some really, really cool stuff on the menu. Yeah, we've been looking at the schedule lately and making sure that we can start planning out what we're doing. And um, if, if it all shapes up the way we want it to, it's going to be an action-packed uh, year for us and our uh, followers. No question about it. So jumping on, we uh, saw Polaris come out with their uh, Fox Edition uh, Razor 900, which um, actually the important thing about that is uh, the 900 platform doesn't typically come with the, the, the Fox Podium Shocks or the technology package with Ride Command. And so this is kind of an indicator for Polaris on where they're headed uh, to bring um, the entry level all the way up to the premium level across their product lines. So if you're a trail guy over on the East Coast, um, you know, you've kind of really been limited on uh, maybe some of the features and technology packages and suspension packages you can have on your narrower machines. Um, And uh, this just basically gives you hope that uh, the next buy that you do for your rig um, is going to have all the bells and whistles. So look forward to that. If you're looking uh, at the smaller car market next year, um, they're available now if you can find them in the dealer. Um, and then uh, Yamaha announced uh, race bo- going back to the racing scene. Yamaha uh, announced that they're doing races uh, bonuses of up to 15k on their purses. So uh, Yamaha is not. Uh, they we felt like they were disappearing from the racing 
um, the YXZ is getting a little long in the tooth and, and the X3 is kind of starting to take over their athlete roster. Um, but the X, but the, the YXZ is not going anywhere. And um, there looks like they're not going to be putting out a car at the end of this year like we thought they were going to. Um, but maybe next year, you know, never know what will happen. But uh, they're definitely investing in racing and, the, and their athletes. I, I've heard from some people that would be in the know that said that the YXZ really isn't going to change over the next year. And just as an end user, whether it be doing what we do, which is mountain riding, trail riding, uh, overlanding, I feel like the YXZ is incredibly tough, incredibly durable, just crazy reliable, but I really feel like it's about $10,000, and I mean that, a solid $10,000 behind the Turbo S and the X3 in terms of getting it to the baseline, to where we're in a place where we can compete now. Yeah, there's that. That's the that's the ultimate dilemma with the YXZ, right? Is that it's a great machine for the trail, uh, but if you want to really push, you know, your abilities and where you're going to be riding or if you're racing, you're 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 already looking at, um, you know, investing at least another twenty thirty percent of what you bought it for. So, and that's and that's that. I think it does a disservice to the machine. I, I don't think it'd be too much of a challenge for them to stretch that thing out. Maybe maybe. Maybe update the whole car by lengthening the chassis a little bit. Maybe widening it. I, I think if I think they have it in their head that if they wind it, they widen it. It could take away some of that East Coast market. There's no shortage of YXEs out on the East Coast, right? Um, and it very well could. It could make it a little bit limited on the East Coast, but you know the West Coast, the desert racing is kind of king and. They're at such a disadvantage for desert racing right now. I mean, they're still kind of the car, the naturally aspirated car to beat on short course. But take short course community, man, this is going to get me in trouble for saying this, but take short course community all in. And I mean, we probably have somewhere between five to 10,000 enthusiasts throughout the United States. And that's, that's not the biggest bucket out there. So having a, having a car that checks that box, that it's a short course weapon, just really, really gives you an advantage right out of the box. I don't think that that's going to translate to being a attractive feature for a buyer. Yeah. And if, if they were going to stretch their car out, they'd have to seriously look at, you know, switching to a trailing arm or, you know, a, a wishbone trailing arm or something like that. Uh, cause the double A arms really not going to support a longer car. And they got away with it with the shorter base, um, and and how they can be a little bit more nimble that way. But um, there would be some serious, significant uh, chassis design changes if they were going to make that car longer. Um, jumping into February, uh, we had some uh, trip time over to the coast, and we'll get to that a little bit later. But um, that feels like that literally feels like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? It really, <laughs> yeah. Um, but we went to Winchester and before we went there, we did a couple stops along the way, get some upgrades on your X3 that you, um, only had for a few months at that point. Um, and, uh, you got some new paddles for it and you got an Evo stage three R cat delete. Um, kind of what were your thoughts on now having a year under your belt? Um, what, what are your impressions with the Evo stage three R and you know, what were your thoughts on those scats? After, because now you've you've tried other tires as well. You've had CSTs and you've had some other ones on your other rigs. Um, kind of, what are your thoughts on the X on the Scats and the Evo? So, <clears throat> the the first drive that I did on that Evo 3R, we we've kind of covered it before. Was was out at Winchester, and so it's really hard to kind of get an idea of how much power you're putting to the ground until you're on dirt. And on dirt and stock condition, the X3 feels like it scoots really well. It is night and day on the 3R, but it wakes it up a ton. But you don't really feel that out at Winchester because when we were out there, we were riding in some pretty wet sand. We were, um, uh, this was the first time I'd ever put paddles on the car. So the car, the car did not disappoint one bit out there. It felt awesome, had a blast. You know, you and I had a, we, we had a great time out there. But it wasn't until I got home and put my dirt tires back on that I realized exactly what that 3R tune would do for the car. And yeah, it definitely woke it up. I would say the most surprising and, and, uh, the best feature that I discovered, uh, on that 3R tune was running it in eco mode and running it on the green key. Despite an aggressive uh, mapping profile, it really didn't make it to where I was 
having really short durations from a fuel consumption standpoint. Like I, I, I think the record, I think I've gone like 125 to 130 on a GPS between fueling, uh, fueling up, which is probably, you know, off the cuff, I'm, I'm thinking it's maybe like 17, 18 miles per gallon. And the information that I'd read prior to that was that I was not going to see numbers like that, that, you know, fuel consumption was going to be an issue. It just wasn't my experience. And when you filled up, it was never really like, it was never really like a full tank. You always had reserves in there. So yeah, the gas gauge lies, you know, the uh, car holds, I believe nine and a half gallons. And when I'm got a fuel light on and go to top it off, I want to say I, the maximum amount of fuel I've ever put in that car was just a smidge over seven. So in theory, I probably had just shy of 30 miles left on that tank, maybe even a little bit more. So that, that fuel, that fuel gauge lies a little bit, but to answer your question about those scats, uh, I've run, I've run some 12 blades on my Yamaha. I've run some 10 blades on the RZR Pro. The scat is far and away the best feel that I've ever had on the dunes, but it's also on a totally different car, you know, so it, it, it would, I would have to run those scats on a YXE and then run them on that RZR Pro to really get a great feel for them. But in terms of the best dune car that I drove in 2020, uh, my X3 on scats on that 3R, far and away, far and away was the best uh, best machine that that I got to dune in 2020. And and you're uh, you're not a um, extremely exuberant, different terrain type of rider on the dunes. You like to carve, you like to go fast, you like to, you know, jump once in a while. Uh, nothing too extreme as far as cutting back and forth, but you like to whip it around a lot. And I would assume that a, a more paddle, a bigger, stiffer, more molded tire or something like that would be a little less your style because you like to slide a little bit more when you're when you're throwing it around the dunes. Yeah, too much paddle and the car is going to have a tendency to push, but that also is kind of a caveat of horsepower. You know, I want to say the sweet spot for dunes is about 185, 185 horsepower to the wheels. And you start to jump into 200 and, you know, throttle control, things like that become a real big factor because you've got so much power that once you start going through the twisties, some of the trails, you know, some of the big berm trails, the car is just going to have a tendency to really, really push as opposed to react. And yeah, I mean, in terms... As you know, the last ride that we made out at Takeover, out in Coos Bay, my car is super springy right now. You know, it needs to be lowered a little bit. Uh, it doesn't really have a lot of stability when we start going right to left. It really wants to tip. and But it also just thrives in the whoops compared to what it did before. Before, it was a car that, I mean, like... Uh, you'd attack a whoop section at 60, 70 miles an hour. And for me, like my heart would start to hurt. It was so violent. Those, those springs just cleaned that right up. Uh, so give and take, you know, we're going to, we're going to have to give back a little bit in some of those whoops for the sake of being able to have some more stability going left and right. I definitely don't want it having that feeling, uh, like it wants to tip, but I can tell you that, uh, jumping it, jumping it became a lot more predictable with right. that with that spring package and and just to clarify you have uh shock therapy springs you don't have the valving or anything but you just have the springs and i think they're a they're not a heavyweight spring they're like a midweight spring correct yeah they're sprung for a rider that's my you know they they weren't custom tailored for me i got a great deal on them and they were made for a guy that weighs somewhere around 240 pounds for an x3 and uh, they, it just so happens that they work out really, really well. Um, but yeah, like I said, the, the car feels a lot more p- predictable when you're jumping. It feels great in the whoops, but we've got some work to do. And you mentioned not doing any sort of revalving. The key word is yet. Right. It's on the menu. <laughs> right. Definitely. All right. And then uh, in March, Polaris, going back to kind of how they're progressing in their packaging, uh, they adopted the new uh, Sport Premium Ultimate strategy across all their product lines. So they launched it with their uh, Pro XP earlier, but no one really took notice of it. And then they came out with it on their General in March. And uh, basically, Sport was just a rebranding of their baseline trim. Um, they didn't really have a name for that outside of base trim. Uh, so having a Sport... Uh, uh, kind of gave it a little bit more of a uh, marketable appeal. Um, 
but uh, that's something to be looking for if you're confused on which products are on the product roster for Polaris. Uh, just assume that there's going to be a sport premium and ultimate and everything they do going forward. Um, and the sport's just going to be your basic uh, trim package with uh, Walker Evans. Your premium's going to be uh, the technology upgrade where you get maybe the touchscreen and the ride command, things like that. And then the ultimate will be your dynamics uh, shock upgrade to uh, the car as, as well as um, I believe the audio inclusion. So uh, getting a stereo uh, in the car from the factory. So anyways, that's just a new marketing strategy for them that came out and something for uh, consumers to be aware of. Not not to be like uh, a Debbie Downer or anything like that, but for 2020, were you hoping for a little bit more? Because it seemed like the OEs stepped up their game, not from a horsepower standpoint, not from a suspension standpoint, but you started to see them release almost like luxury models of what they had the year before. Like, uh, big, you know, stereo systems from the factory. Uh, I, I Was that a disappointment? Um, I would say that, and we'll get into this a little bit later when we talk about trends, but the, um, the, the idea that 21 w- or 20 was going to bring um, any kind of revelations was, I kind of had lost that hope going into February, just because we didn't see it in January. Um, but uh, I would have hoped for more technology. I would have uh, hoped that, um, you know, there might have been uh, some, some, decent upgrades to the Polaris ride command system. There would have been um, some sort of technology package from Can-Am there. You know, Yamaha has their uh, Garmin integration uh, with their tablet uh, GPS system that they have. Um, So I I was hoping that they would come out with something uh, more interesting, but at the same time, you know, their product team looking at the 20 roadmap after Rona, you know, probably was a little bit hesitant to maybe push something new that wasn't ready yet. Um, and, and figured that they had more time to develop it and, and, and put it out in a higher fashion in the following year. So um, that's kind of where I was. I, I just figured that they all kind of just said, hey, we're not going to rush this. We're just going to take the, the free time that was given to us to, you know, work on it and, and develop it a little bit more. Yeah, whatever ambition they had with 2020 models and 2021 models obviously was very, very affected by COVID, no question about it. But hopefully hopefully we're not having the same dialogue next year. Hopefully somebody really throws a nice howitzer shot across the bow of the industry and we get a car that's just... And you and I have seen pictures of that car. But uh, <laughs> hopefully, it's a, uh, hopefully it's a real step, uh, step in a direction that the other OEs really take notice of. Maybe it is the speed car. Maybe maybe it's the Turbo R. You know, the speed car, they, they're coming out with, you know, a big uh, screen for their dash and, and things like that. And they're including uh, features that we don't uh, see currently in the market, including screen uh, casting from your phone, things like that. Um, and so there is some progression in that area, but we still have to see that actually get delivered, right? We still haven't seen the car get delivered. We haven't seen a final product yet. Um, but I believe that with with a lot of the patents we've seen from Polaris, I know that they're moving in that direction of pushing technology into their cars. I know that with Can-Am's move into the smart shocks that they've they're they're looking to that future as well. Um, but uh, we just haven't seen it yet. So, um, but speaking of of some of those upgrades, Honda in March also launched their live valve talons for both their 1000X and 1000R cars. Um, giving you both a entry level non active shock car and then also the uh, live valve option. So uh, seeing them come out uh, kind of started a trend where we're going to start seeing everybody doing that. The Polaris has lost their exclusivity on the live valve pat, um, package, um, and so we're going. That's why we're seeing Honda, we're seeing uh, Can Am, and um, potentially we'll get to it eventually in our next episode. You know, we might see a KRX with uh, live valve as well. So. Um, but uh, but just assume that every machine is going to have a premium option in 21 with a live valve option. So uh, especially with the, the launch of IQS and things like that, uh, you're going to pretty much see that on all the OEs. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's almost no news. I, I'm not going to say it's no news. There were a lot of <clears throat> there were a lot of uh, uh, evolutions, not revolutions. I think we talked about Japanese OEs a ton more in 2020, but. I think we're a little bit away, ways away from a Japanese OE being on the radar for me 
in terms of something that I want to purchase? And uh, it, it, do you find it to be a little bit similar for you? Yeah, I'm I'm interested to see where Kawasaki goes. I'm interested to see where Yamaha goes in 21, um, if they actually do a push to change anything up. Um, you know, with Kawasaki, they're they're ripe for a technology upgrade and a performance upgrade, right? And uh, so, you know, it would be interesting to see if Kawasaki can come out with the first ever OEM supercharged car, or if they're going to stick to the tried and true turbo. Um, but uh, yeah, we're we're looking forward to what uh, the Asian manufacturers have to bring to the market because, uh, as far as performance goes, you know, Can Am stepped up their game a little bit this last year with their RRs, but uh, really, you know, nothing really has changed as far as performance goes. You have either that hundred to hundred and ten horsepower naturally aspirated car, or you have that hundred and sixty five to one ninety five turbo car. And uh, the price, the prices reflect that. And that's basically it. So um, it'd be interesting to see, you know, how we, where we land at the end of 21. Yeah, I think if, uh, if I'm behind the wheel of a Turbo S or an X3, I feel like I'm picking apart first world problems. Whereas when I, when I'm behind the wheel of one of the Japanese OE, they all do everything very, very well. But the gripes that I have are a lot more costly than what, uh, where I would start from on, you know, some of the, the Polaris and the Can-Am models. Uh, moving towards the end of March, we started seeing COVID really shut down our industry, shut down our riding uh, areas, things like that. We started seeing dunes uh, get shut down. We started seeing trail systems get gated off. Um, for whatever reason, people in government think that the outdoors spreads Rona. And uh, we all know the truth behind that, but uh, we're not going to sit here and, and discuss that topic. But March was kind of the um, inflection point of our industry getting pushed back on, and uh, which is interesting because, uh, as we'll see later in the year, we started seeing record numbers of sales. So, um, but it was just kind of a definitive point to keep in mind that March was the was the month where the government tried to shut us down, and uh, you know we've talked a lot about um, supporting groups that try to open up trails, that try to open up on road um, legalization. Uh, We've talked about that, but it's also important that we pay attention to what's happening in the bigger picture and make sure that we're supporting um, legislation and legislators that will make sure to not um, shut down our industry. So, Well, and you and I had a long talk about that yesterday, actually. It's not just Corona. It's uh, communities. You know, there's places that are shutting down UTV accesses, access to places that we want to go to that, that events historically have thrived at. And uh, it's it's up to us to keep visibility on that sort of stuff and advocate. Yeah, there's also the the side of it that doesn't get talked out talked about a lot because no one likes to talk about it. But there's our industry has this history of not giving two f's about what anyone thinks and having a party at the end of the day or all day long. And you know we're out in this wilderness area that. You know, if I leave a, a can or a trash bag or whatever, it's really not going to be a big deal because it's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but the reality of it is those bad apples are what is the biggest influencer in how these people approach opening or shutting down our, our ability to ride. So um, there's been some discussion lately on, on some groups about not being a jerk out on the trail, not being um, a jerk to to go around or skirt the rules, things like that. Um you know, leave it better than you found it. Make sure that you're respecting the the nature that you are allowed to use and the places you're allowed to ride so that we can all come back the next time. Yeah, I really feel like we have to police ourselves. You know, Moab could have 250 side-by-sides on it at any given moment, and all it takes is one. All yep. it takes is one guy out there burning rubber on rocks one guy out there uh, passing Jeeps on trails, going places that they're not supposed to be, jumping off the trail like they're not supposed to. And that's, in effect, by default, they're going to wind up representing the entire side-by-side community based on miscreant behavior. And, yeah, I really feel like we're going to have to start policing ourselves a lot more. You know, you can't be you can't be booming a bunch of a rap music or, or heavy metal or something going through Moab at two in the morning when you're changing from one trail to another. It's just a non-starter anymore. And they've already fired back. We're already seeing the consequences of those type of actions. 
And to be clear, it's not just Moab. Like if you're out in the woods, right. you're out in the middle of the forest and you don't put your fire out. Like if you don't quench your fire and you start a forest fire and they find out it was you with a side by side camping, like that instantly is bad karma on our industry. And yeah, if all the news story is going to say is UTV starts forest fire. <laughs> yep, exactly. And um, if you're, you know, out in going through some of the, like we, when we rode the BDRs, we were going through these little small towns, right? That are uh, 200 people, maybe even less. And if uh, like we showed up at night one um, in, um, was it pine, yellow pine? And they, uh, they were like, Hey, can you, can you turn off your uh, light bars and stuff? You're shining right in people's houses. Like that's a respect thing. Like I wasn't even thinking about it. I thought it was like 1030 at night. I figured everyone was asleep or something, but yet I was the jerk waking people up. Right. So um, we just have to be respectful of the communities and the areas we go. And it's really important. Like we've talked about it a few times now, but it's, it's, it's just so important that we take care of what we have before we lose it. Right. Yeah. We've had some talk conversation about, the overlanding mountain riding element and how it's an ascending trend in the UTV community. And the main obstacle is pavement. Well, the only way to get past that obstacle is to, uh, abide, you know, stop, stop be riding like a bunch of selfish jerks. And it, unfortunately it's a reality in this industry. Yep. And, and we're not saying we've, you know, not done any of these stupid things ourselves. Like we're not, you know, perfect, but we I have, have 200 to. horsepower. I want to use it, you know, <laughs> but time and place, you know. Right. And so we just all got to get better at it. And we all got to get on the same page to make sure that uh, it's still there next year. Um, jumping into April, uh, Speed UTV details uh, on their new car started to really kind of take shape. We had been talking about it since the previous fall. Um, they had promised this car going to be launched at the end of the year of 2020 that uh, would satisfy the needs of all the desert guys out there. Um and uh, so in April, we started seeing those details come out, the development starting to begin. And uh, they, you know, to their credit, they've they've done a really good job of being fairly transparent on their process, uh, doing live videos every week and sh showing you the development. Granted, um, not as fast as we would want them to develop and to not be as complete as we want them to be. But uh, it was just an interesting storyline to follow of, um, you know, somebody trying to start a new UTV brand and and being somewhat transparent in the process where everybody else has been completely shut off from the rest of the world. All right. Yeah, I, uh, we all want to see this thing develop currently, you know, as it pertains to the stuff that they're releasing. It's kind of a lightning rod for dialogue. You'll have people questioning the process and you'll have people excited about the process. I, I would I would find, I think you and I, I speak for you and I, that you and I are the latter. We're excited about it. We're excited to see where it goes. But, uh, you know, totally understandable of in 2020 for things to be delayed. <laughs> I mean, we can't even get, uh, we can't even get an RV. You know, we're having an RV and a trailer built right now as we speak. And these RV dealerships are not waiting on steel. They're waiting on things like air conditioners. You know, they're waiting on these parts that Corona has really held up. And in the UTV industry, it shocks, you know, it's these, it's these various components that are delaying this sort of stuff. So, right. You know, speed from the information they have released, I don't think anybody's going to object to the fact that it looks like a really, really attractive car. Um, but, you know, hopefully we see it out there. And uh, he's been out testing uh, his race car uh, demo unit. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens when they actually get a retail product made and we can actually see how that performs versus their test buggy. Um, and then in May, like we had mentioned before, uh, that's when really we started seeing the UTV buying uh, spree start. So uh, May was kind of the month that um, basically dealerships started selling out, um, started seeing inventories deplete and and timelines start to, to get longer on on receiving these units. Uh, but they they really you know, it was kind of out of nowhere. No one really expected to be such a, we're so used to seeing a hundred units in a dealership's parking lot all year long. Um, and it was just super interesting to see that, you know, people want to be outside. People want an experience outside of their desk job. Right. And, uh, it just goes back to validate our, our thought process on how the industry is growing and how it's exploding. Um, 
you know, if you're already in the industry, you don't see it. But when you're looking at, at it from the outside and looking at the logistics and the numbers and how things are happening, um, you know, 21 is going to be a really busy trail season. Uh, there's going to be a lot more cars on the trail. There's going to be a lot more cars at the at the dunes. There's going to be a lot more cars uh, even available for sale, uh, used cars. Um, there's going to be a lot of people that have been upgrading with um, some of the sales that happened early in the year. And then just some of the technology packages that came out with the new smart shocks, things like that. People are jumping on board saying, okay, it's finally time to upgrade. Um, I see the used market being a huge thing in 21. And uh, I'm going to be super interested to see how, uh, how that affects our industry and how that changes the landscape on, you know, purchasing decisions. If you're going to buy new or used, does it make sense to, to pay um, a premium for a good used unit versus um, the lowest you know, base package on a, on a new unit. So, um, it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. Yeah. 20, uh, 2020 did kind of, it, it really did wonders for the mom and pop shops out there. We started to see more and more of them pop up and I don't think that demand is going anywhere for at least the next 24 months. And I think a lot of that has to do with those that were ready to handle the online buying process and those who didn't because if you, depending on who you talk to they either are the biggest year ever or the worst year ever and i think that really comes down to who's ready to be um an online presence with their storefront um versus somebody that's relied on walk-ins and so um if you're a if you're a small business and you haven't uh finalized your transition to being 100 percent compatible to both markets uh, now's the time to get it dialed in so that you're ready for spring. Um, in June, we had the KRX, uh, drop some new models and we were all super excited to see a performance upgrade to their KRX platform that at that point had been out for, I don't know, eight months, something like that. Um, yeah, we were all let down. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm smiling because of in behind me in your uh, spreadsheet footnote all it says is qu- uh, parentheses face, face palm, palm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the industry great, as great a whole. car but it need it needs some uh it, it needs uh, needs to evolve a little bit i have a theory that uh it's purely a tune thing i think that if they were to launch a a, a sport spec model that had a different tuning and a different pedal mapping and things like that. Um, it probably would be a killer machine as far as performance goes. Um, but, uh, they're either, they're either trying to hold on to it as an upgrade path for over the next season, or they're coming out with something better than that motor and that tune will trickle down to the, to Terex. Yeah, so you and I have both driven that car, and it really does make things very easy. It does things very easy, but if you had been on the Idaho run for 1,400 miles in that car, I think you and I both know it would have thrived. It would have absolutely oh, ate that terrain on. But would you have fallen asleep? Uh, that's the question. <laughs> yeah, that's that's very possible. <laughs> yeah, and I don't mean that as I don't mean that as shade. People people have a a, pref- a preference as it pertains to the ride that they get. The Kawasaki has a tendency to make things really, really easy. You know, I, I think when we did our review of it, correct me if I'm wrong, we were talking about the fact that it's a car that I you could put anybody in that has never been behind the wheel of a UTV, and it's going to make them uh, it's going to make them a competent driver almost immediately just because of how easy it is to drive and how I mean it's a wonderful car. It's just it's I think it's the difference between an Escalade and a Raptor. You know. Right. Like one, one's made, one's made to do a whole bunch of stuff. Very, very, uh, that's a terrible analogy, but, <laughs> but, but it really is. It really has that kind of feel like the Raptor seems like something, or I'm sorry, the X3 seems like something that the second you disrespect it, it's going to bite you. Whereas the Cowie, it, it, it'd be hard pressed to find trouble with that car. I think it, it goes to that whole, uh, there's two, two types of riders. There's the guy that just wants to go out and cruise and have a good time. And then there's the guy that wants to be scared a little bit by what he's capable of and uh, held to the to that edge and living life on the edge. Um, yeah. So I, I, I want my car to be like a trained tiger, you know, and that trained tiger just loves you and it's exhilarating. It's amazing. But just and you just disrespect <laughs> it just a little bit. It'll rip your head off, you know. <laughs> right. That's what I want. Um, 
So yeah, great car. Hopefully, uh, as we'll mention later, they're going to come out with some new model releases in January. Um, and once again, we're all sitting with our fingers crossed. Um, moving on, uh, your friend uh, Taylor at uh, GeForce Offroad transitioned his company to be Amped Offroad. That was kind of a neat thing to happen, um, going fully independent and making um, making a new name for himself and and the company that he's uh, been passionate about for the last few years. Um, so if you don't, if you're not aware of GeForce or Amped Offroad, they make um, safety equipment, safety helmets, uh, harnesses, yeah. things like that. So um, shout out to him for for getting it done and and making the changes necessary. And uh, good luck to him in 21. Yeah, within the last 48 hours, they actually just released their little uh, collab with uh, Shreddy Life right, on yeah. the, the, Wil- the the Wilkie signature helmet that's live right now. So go check that out. Yeah, those those are pretty hot helmets. If you like a, a mm-hmm. very uh, busy helmet, um, my daughter just asked me for one. <laughs> and then talking about technology, before uh, June was when Can Am actually came out with their Smart Smart Shocks uh, models. Um, so that I think they did a poor job of educating the market on what they were actually releasing. Um, they basically said, here's here's the same car you had last year, uh, but it has better shocks on it. Whereas they should have um, came out and said, you know, this is different than Polaris. This is different than Honda. This is different than everybody else because uh, we have a whole lot more sensors. We have wheel position sensors. We have all these different things going into it that are different. Um, and that includes even like how you purchase aftermarket A-arms and things like that, because now we got different things attached to the unit. Um, and I think they could have done a better job educating the market. But um, the the Smart Shocks and the Can-Ams are different in, in that they have more sensors, but they also um, have slow and fast rebound uh, compression as well as rebound. So um, the Polaris doesn't have that. They have a simple one-action um uh, adjustment and uh, anybody that has a live valve package like Honda that has the IQS integration is again just an automated clicker is all it is and uh, these smart shocks are different in that you have three different valvings that are all getting affected by these changes and when you look at what like um, like shock therapy they can come out and they can actually put the IQS on that as well and then you have you know however many settings of adjustment on the smart shocks times three so uh, pretty interesting what they're doing there. Um, from what I've been told, those shocks are are very capable, but they're not set up really well from the factory. And so you're going to want to explore some of those options that um, aftermarket uh, shock tuners can do, um, including shock therapies, IQS upgrades, things like that. Um, at the end of June, we also saw the, the first four-cylinder Polaris motor come out in their slingshot. So they, they launched a greater than 1,000cc four-cylinder motor that was going to go into their kind of like motorcycle, car, hybrid slingshot vehicle. And they were really quiet about the release. They were, they were vocal in the slingshot community, but they were really quiet outside of that. And I think it was because of some of the rumors that we've had uh, circulating. Yeah, there, so snowmo cycle <laughs> their snowmo cycle i like that yeah. i like that we'll go with that um but uh that was the first uh in in my view the first reveal of what we're going to expect in 21 with a new model release that um we've been <laughs> back and forth on dates with but um as we've talked about there's reasons for that so um but uh june was the first time we saw what the future of polaris power is going to look like um, in July, we released that KRX 1000 review um, that came out. People enjoyed that. Uh, Red Bull came out with their OT3 car at Dakar, which was really interesting and continues some of that kind of development cycle that we saw um, on the Razor platform, even though the OT3 is 0% Razor outside of the headlights. Um, the platform itself was very, very similar to what we've been rumoring for the, the pro R coming out. So, uh, it was, I, I would love to be the fly on the wall on, you know, what the discussions were around that car, how much of it's going to be geared towards winning to car, how much of it's going to be t- towards proving the platform, how much of it's going to be, you know, give and take things like that. That would have been a great, uh, great group of guys to really sit around and absorb knowledge from. And then, you know, right after that, obviously, we went into full blown rumor mode with the Pro R and and started releasing some of our uh, details that we uh, knew were to be rumored. And I put out a rendering of the car. Um, People still question us to this day that, you know, we're just fake news and and things like that. But uh, 
we can't uh, we can't put out what we've seen, but we can put out what we know. <laughs> if that makes <laughs> That's sense. right. Um, yeah, Zach is so good on Photoshop. He totally mocked up that picture of that Pro R with the uh, uh, long travel. Yeah, uh, if you haven't seen it, you probably won't, and we're not going to share it with you. But <laughs> but, but yeah, nonetheless, I, yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting release, and we'll probably correct me if I'm wrong. That was one of the biggest. Uh, most engaged posts that side by side guys had in 2020, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So, uh, there's, there's a few, uh, lingering videos from previous years that continue to get traffic, but the pro R uh, rumors podcast and the story and the rendering, those all are hot topics. And it proves that people are eager and hungry for something in that class. They're looking for something of that performance level. And my favorite was when we re- when when we released that episode about the rumors about that thing, like it got so many thumbs down. It's like <laughs> what, what what like what are these people expecting, man? It's like it's like the car the the car is no secret. We've referred to it as the worst kept secret in UTV for almost two years now. We get a rendering and not a rendering, an actual picture. <laughs> I've literally spoken to people face to face who have driven it and given me feedback on it they're they're subjected to an NDA so I'm not going to name names and I'm, and they and they were very careful about what they said but the car is real no question about it and for whatever reason it just it was a lightning rod for <laughs> uh for conversation it's almost like bringing up speed UTV in the middle of a Can-Am group like it just it it just polarizes people and uh, people are either just over it or they are super excited and are biting at the bit to to put their money down so yeah I get tagged in a lot of stuff on Facebook Uh, brand stuff no exception Ford versus Chevy versus Dodge and I've just gotten to the uh, to the point where when when I engage with it I'm like you guys go ahead and have this debate I'll be up on the mountain you know, and what I'm driving up on the mountain, I guess we'll see. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, shortly after that, we started seeing um, some revelations of the future of Polaris with uh, some patents that were coming out. Uh, one of the biggest to be noted was their transmission patents of um, a split drive shaft system where the where the power goes to the drive shafts down the middle. Uh, and that would be indicative of, uh, the slingshot. It would be indicative of, uh, the future where the powertrain pushes the, uh, drive shaft forward and then has to get translated down to the drive, uh, line, uh, in some fashion. So, um, the patents, uh, did show a fairly large and substantial transmission and would indicate that the, the multi gear system from the slingshot probably is going to make its way into some other units. Now, to be clear, the Pro R is not going to have that same transmission, but it's rumored to be putting it out there, hashtag rumor, that it's going to be a sequentially shifted CVT. So we'll see what happens there. But that system does... It's it's literally on a lot of people's radar. I know a lot of marketing people in Southern California that are holding off on purchasing a new UTV. They want to see what happens with this first before they make it. They want to see what happens with this and they they probably want to see what happens with the Robbie car as well. Right. And uh, in August, uh, we would typically be hearing news from Camp Razor. And typically, you would see uh, the opportunity for Polaris to come out gangbusters with a product release uh, at their biggest party of the year, which is Camp Razor. Uh, but that didn't happen in August, right? COVID shut it down. They weren't going to be able to have the numbers of people and the proximity and all that kind of stuff. So uh, for the first time that I can remember, Camp Razor was canceled. Um, and uh, I think that was the intended launch date for the Pro R. I think that was originally what was going to be the game changer dateline. Um, but uh, with, the, with the cancellation of that, they had to readjust and, and all that and push it later into the year. We assumed it was going to come out in December. Um, and then uh, December 1st came and went and we didn't see it. Uh, so uh, going into September, um, one of the bigger releases of the year, Yamaha released its Wolverine R-Max 1000 and 1004 uh, units, which, um, you know, I actually had the chance to go uh, shoot some video on uh, this last month. And I'm going to put that video together and do a first looks and impressions on that. Um, but uh, the car is is essentially a, an evolution of the Terex line. And um, if you were to line them up side by side, and actually on our website, we have a little slider thing that you can go back and forth on. They're very similar. The things that have changed, um, suspension, uh, front end, uh, interior cab, 
uh, comforts, things like that. So if you were a big Yamaha Terex fan, you're going to be absolutely in love with the R-Max line. Um, more power, more torque. Um, Te- you know, Terex? Yeah, Terex. Wolverine. Oh, geez, I'm all over the place today. All right. Rookie. So, oh, my goodness. <laughs> See, if I just looked at my notes, I would actually be on task here. Uh, but if you're a fan of the Wolverine line, sorry, um, you're going to be right in line with the R-Max. The R-Max is going to bring you more comfort, more options, uh, better suspension travel, uh, better lighting packages, uh, better design, uh, modern comforts, things like that. But you're going to retain the same form and function that the, the Wolverine line had before it. So uh, very similar package, uh, just everything better. Fit and finish is good. Quality materials is good. Uh, thought and lay thought in the layout is good. Um, I really there's you'll have to to watch the video when I push it out. Uh, but there's very little things to complain about if you're in that market for a more utility based sport machine. I'll be accused of being a honk, and it doesn't bug me one bit. But it was and it will go down as the most exciting launch in 2020 for me. <laughs> is that our Mac? Well, it's just because it's a sport utility, you know, it's made to go play on and it's made to go work on. Yeah. Uh, it's made to pull an elk or a deer out of the woods or deliver a bale of hay or, or go get gnarly. Right. And I, I like that. I, I like that. I like that. I, it kind of gave me just a slim hope that maybe Yamaha was listening. And, and they, I mean, you know, I don't know what your opinion is on it, but you know, it, to me, it felt like they saw something, uh, they saw something that uh, a niche within the UTV community that they could really throw a shot across the bow on. I knew I use that analogy a ton. I need to stop doing that. But none, <laughs> nonetheless, I, I feel like they, they, they saw something that they could maybe not necessarily dominate, but at least develop something that would really get an end user's attention and they could have success with. And so far, so good because you can't even get one. I mean, they're all sold out. The Yamaha release and the the Kawasaki release really uh, shows a difference in how they approach their marketing um, versus Polaris, Can-Am, Honda. Uh, they are really building off of what they have proven through the years with their current user set, right? Like they know what their users like, they know what their users want, and it's different than what an X3 buyer wants, right? And so why risk losing that market share um, when they can just make it more appealing to those people to upgrade, but also bring in maybe some new blood that are looking for the same similar feature set. Um, So moving on in September, uh, no shocker here, uh, Nicola's uh, CEO, Trevor Milton, stepped down. Typically, that's not really important to us to talk about technology and startup companies and things like that. But Trevor Milton was pushing um, the the NZT uh, UTV, electric UTV here not too long ago. And we covered the live event and, and we've talked about it throughout the year and things like that. Um, and the rumor is that the unit is scheduled to be released next year. Um, but with the CEO taking over for Trevor, um, and, and just to clarify, Trevor stepped down because of some scandalous stuff with some sexual assault allegations. And on top of that, uh, there was a short uh, seller that was accusing him of fraud on the stock market, things like that. Um, so he eventually was a liability, stepped down from his role and was replaced by his second. And uh, the new CEO, um, his focus is not on changing the world. It's not on changing the industry. It's not on... Um, being a disruptor like Trevor's focus was. It's more about nailing down logistics and getting something to market. And their focus is on diesel replacements, right? Big semi replacements and um, that hybrid um, hydrogen technology, uh, the NZT, the wave, the wave runner replacement, things like that. Those are all like icing on the cake type stuff. And I don't foresee that actually getting invested in going into actually product launches down the road. They may, they may come out with a new like demo model or maybe a, a small fleet of them to kind of promote their brand or whatever. I don't foresee um, NZT coming to anybody's driveway anytime soon. Fraud, sexual harassment, so 2016. <laughs> but it speaks to 20, to 2020 and, and how things just ended up being so. Um, yeah. So right after that, uh, right before a couple of things that happened for you, uh, you received the new Polaris pro XP four. 
um, and it's on the wallpaper of your laptop behind you. The machine is is pretty stout. What are your thoughts on that uh, on that four seater? And what were your thoughts going from a two seater world to a four seater world? Differences between a two seater and a four seater. Anybody that's actually tr- changed up and will can can attest to that. The four seaters have a tendency to ride a lot better, especially in moguls, especially in dunes. Or they're a little trickier to get around on some tight stuff when the tight stuff gets insanely tight. I've never run into any incident where the pro was a disadvantage. Uh, we've stretched it out to 72 inches. It's, you know, we've done, we've, we've put some preload into the truck or into the machine. It looks more like a monster truck right now than it does like a trail riding car. But, uh, we did the HCR long travel on it, RCV axles. Um, Currently, we're just we're still building the car. You know, I I've, I've got uh, I I don't have gripes on the car. I have stuff to do on the car. You know, it needs to get woke up. It's a very very heavy car, and it, it definitely feels that weight, especially at a place like San Hollow. We were out riding it in San Hollow, and as you could, you know, you were riding with me. The, the car in certain features feels labored. And I think a good solid 40 more horsepower to the wheels, maybe 30 more horsepower to the wheels would really nip that in the butt or possibly moving to a much, much smaller and lighter tire, which <laughs> that's just stupid. We're not doing that. But uh, <laughs> but when, when you start to get into some really, really rough stuff, it's a comfortable vehicle. And, you know, for a bigger driver, you know, I'm 6'4", you're 6'4", and... Like it's two. pretty comfortable. I would say uh, pretty much in any seating position, you know, it's comfortable to drive. It's comfortable to be in the back seat. Uh, I am, is it I am not one? as capable in the back seat just because my head starts to tilt over on that new cage. Cause you put a, that's because of the cage new cage though. Yeah. But yeah. if it was OEM cage, the, I would have fit fine. I, I'm not going to say it would be number one on my list to purchase on, uh, for a new vehicle. You know, like I'm a, I'm a big man. I, I love the Turbo S. You know that I love the Turbo S four seater. The Pro, the Pro is a little bit longer. Uh, I want to say it's a little bit heavier. The power, the power before we did all the work on it, before we changed tires, before we put the long travel on, I'd be ripping it around the farm and it, it was quick. It'd have some pickup, you know, it's definitely not an X3, but it's also probably 400 to 600 pounds heavier than my X3. But all in all, you know, I think we're upwards, uh, creeping up a little over a thousand miles on that thing and it's done well. It's done really well. You know, I, I definitely, if, if I were to go pick up a brand new pro, I would get that four seater in the exact same trim it's in right now with the intention of getting rid of its shock combo and upgrading that to like a King, uh, King setup. And in my opinion, I just, there's no way I wouldn't long travel that car. It just, by putting that long travel on it, it really turns into a a different machine, different animal. It really is. You know, I was driving that stock with, it feels really tight, really hard to really kind of do anything wrong. But when you throw the long travel on it, it just seems like it eats You're everything invincible. up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh, we were out at Winchester Bay right before UTV takeover and I didn't have paddles on. And I had a friend of mine driving my X3 and I was wheel to wheel with him. Just literally, we were banging wheel to wheel on there. Once you start going through corners, once you start going through features like whoops, that was the car to beat because you could hold so much speed on it. And it wasn't until you would start climbing hills, climbing big dunes, doing jumps, like super technical features that, that the two seater was really had something for it. You know, that, as you know, that four seater, just those four seaters really gobble up uh, terrain. Yeah. I just responded to a thread uh, last night about a two seater versus four seater debate. And, you know, having driven both and, and experienced both the two seater, if you were to summarize it, Two seaters are tight. They're they're twitchy. Uh, they're a lot of fun and a lot more adrenaline. The four seater is more controlled. More um, you can do a lot more like slow maneuver, like controlled environment type stuff. Um, and so it just depends on on where your adrenaline uh, likes to live. If you want to be on the edge, you know you're probably a two seater guy. If you like to have a little bit more control and and like to kick back a little bit more, then the four seater is probably up your alley too. I think it would be cool for you and I to park it next to a X3 Max and take a tape measure and see how they compare from a dimension standpoint. You know, like the the X3 Max is a nine tenths uh, class ten car, and I want to. I would really like to know how close that Pro is to the, that that dimension. And uh, um, you know, there's a reason that the guys that are racing Baja, the guys that are racing the best in the Desert Series, are 
racing four seater cars. Right. Or or stretched out two seaters, which is essentially exactly. just a four seater. So Yep. Um so yeah, oh, real quick, not to cut you off too, but watch the results. You know, there there's no shortage of class ten, uh, class ten winners coming across the finish line after UTVs have. Right. You know, after four seater UTVs have. So UTVs from a power to weight standpoint really, really have something for that class ten class. And if you don't know what a class ten is, a class ten is like a it's it's an open wheel. Uh, desert class, and I want to say they operate off the Ecotec two liter GM motor, and uh, I think they're, I want to say they're capped at about four hundred horsepower, but you're also talking about a thirty five hundred to four thousand pound machine as opposed to a Max. You know, a Can Am Max, you can probably stay around a ton, probably put two hundred and twenty to horsepower to the wheels reliably. That's going to be really, really formidable. Yeah, from the, a power the average standpoint built out Max is around. Uh, 2,400, 2,500 pounds. So. Oh, is it? Yeah. 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 Uh, unless, so I, you're, unless you're Wes, our buddy, that's probably running like 3,500 <laughs> with all the gear he puts on that thing. <laughs> uh, so right after you got the Pro uh, 4, you went on a little trip up in Conconoli and did a DP episode. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, Destination Polaris. Uh, you want to talk about kind of like dreams coming true, not to get weird on you or anything like that. But when I got on, when I got on at full river, full throttle, uh, my, I was hired to take full throttle and, and go just go sell batteries. And one of the easiest ways to do that. And one of the most effective ways to do that was because the battery was doing its job was to tell stories, you know, and, uh, I, I would start to get into the, I got into this community and I saw where, what people were paying attention to and kind of started to set out a little bit of a to-do list right off the bat. Destination Polaris was the first thing that caught my eye. I brought it to the attention of the company and we were paying attention to it, but this is at a time where they, from a marketing standpoint and advertising standpoint were, uh, they had everything that they needed. And, you know, at, at that point, there really wasn't too much of a role for us with that show. Things changed over the next 18 months. Uh, I just remember being at the 2018, this is late in the year, the 2018 Rally in the Pines out in, uh, oh my gosh, Salmon, Idaho. And I met Chuck uh, Cicerelli from Razorback Off-Road. And Chuck and I had some co- uh, conversation about doing some stuff together, mostly organic and mostly by way of uh, full throttle, Razorback, side-by-side guys. And you kind of had started to develop a relationship with Razorback as well. Uh, away from the full throttle side of things. But one of the things that I discussed with him at that show was possibly doing this, this episode, doing, doing something with that particular show. And and 16 months later, we were, we were featured on it. I didn't expect for it to come together that quick. That's for sure. But it it wound up being amazing, you know, and part of the reason why is uh, Polaris, Polaris wants to really start to capture the overland and adventure riding s- style uh, trips and uh, really kind of make sure that that element of the market has representation on either that show or in the community. And so I've seen the episode. It's fantastic. I'm really, really proud of it. And it basically it's marketed as Destination Polaris's first overland trip. So it, it turned out really great. I think it airs in April. I'm really looking forward to everybody seeing it. Can't wait to see it. Um, and it goes to, you know, we've talked about Overland becoming a thing. And, and I think in 21, it's going to be even more so. So uh, don't don't be surprised when we are covering uh, that topic a lot next year. So at the end of the month, uh, Polaris announced they had a strategic partnership with Zero Motorcycles. Um, Zero Motorcycles makes electric dirt bikes, basically, um, and street bikes. Uh, they're a really fantastic manufacturer of those things. If you talk to anyone that owns them, they just absolutely love them. But basically, this is a, a follow through with Polaris's commitment announced in the previous fall about wanting to engage the electric market and become a manufacturer of vehicles that are both, um, you know, petrol based, but also uh, looking forward to the future of an electric based uh, product set. So they they committed to an electric version of every single one of their product lines uh, at, in some sort of form. Um, and since they own Indian motorcycles and things like that, uh, and they're into the timber sled, uh, they own timber sled and they're into the dirt bike community things like that it made a made real easy sense for them to jump on board with the progression that the technology's made with the bikes um, but this is more of a precursor to what's going to be happening 
in their other product lines. They already have electric golf carts, things like that, uh, manufacturing facility vehicles. Uh, so they're taking all that technology and they're going to start focusing on the bigger market, uh, consumer market. And uh, don't be surprised if you see an electric uh, general or an electric razor um, in the next few years. Yeah, and it's going to get, I mean, I, I can't wait for the reviews. <laughs> I, can't, I can't wait for the dialogue in the community. The only thing I'll, I'll remind people of is when the automobile was manufactured, horse horse fan said that it would never take off. So I, I'm, I'm telling you right now, I, I'm of the position that if it has four wheels and goes fast and it's capable, I can have fun on it. Oh, for sure. Uh, we won't be seeing those cars in the overland market, though. So we'll... Uh... We'll have to see what the hey, range is. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in October, uh, Polaris announced their uh, efforts to send athletes to Dakar. Um, your friends Wayne and Kristen Matlock uh, and Craig Scallon kind of heading up that the driving efforts there. And, and that's going to actually be happening here fairly shortly next month, I think. And um, we're going to see the results of Polaris' uh, big push into uh, overseas racing. Um, but I think more so they're going to use that as a launch effort uh, or a media effort to launch into their next release of their cars. Um, and I think that uh, we're going to see Polaris really investing hard into desert racing in 21. I think that they lost too much market share in 20. I think that they have a new car coming out, and I think that they're going to dominate uh, their marketing efforts in dirt, uh, in specifically desert racing um, in 21. I think that you're going to primarily associate Polaris with desert racing in 21 versus all the different markets that you keep hearing in marketing um, their, sell, their, their products in uh, over the last few years. I think the most interesting thing is, is we just talked about Yamaha finding a niche with that R-Max and then attacking that niche with that car. Uh, if you go back 18 months, give or take, Can-Am was just all in on King of Hammers. And they wanted they wanted to take King of Hammers down, and then they did. And then in 2019, uh, was it 2019 or 2020? Uh, Casey Curry won Dakar on an X3, and now it, it's just so funny. You have you have Yamaha carving out a, a specific, almost like a boutique type rig that's really really custom tailored to a certain person that wants a certain ride, whereas Can Am and Polaris are essentially just firing back on each other. You know essentially just doubling down. It's like Can-Am wanted King of the Hammers. They got it and they, they've been kicking butt and best of the desert. And then they won Dakar. And now we're watching Polaris just going all in on Dakar, basically going, oh yeah, well, we're going to have something for you. And I think it's awesome. I, I think it's absolutely awesome. And we, we've had discussions earlier in the year about the possibility of um, the OEs going into niche markets. We talked about, you know, possibly seeing a desert specific car and an East Coast specific car and a rock crawling specific car, m rock crawling slash mud. And we've already started seeing that with the success of the Can-Am, you know, XRC, uh, the car you drive, right? Like, uh, how many times have you seen people going for the RC versus going for the RS? right? Like the, the, the market for the RC is huge because it's such an amazingly capable car. And with Polaris doing a real big push into the desert scene with possibly a new vehicle and the racing efforts and things like that, like, I think those predictions are coming true. I think we're going to start seeing it might not be in the like the verbiage that we would typically assume like a, a desert or a sand or a trail or a whatever. I think they're going to, they're going to have to have some bleed over in the different markets. But they're going to have these very specific cars that um, are going to have more broad appeal um, and that they can charge a premium for. Right. And uh, the at the end of the day, the winner is going to be us. It's not going to be the OEs. It's <laughs> right. going to be the consumer. The consumer is totally set up to win. And uh, with the bigger market acceptance of the vehicles and thus the bigger push to have more places to ride, um, it's just going to open the door to more and more unique vehicles that have more to offer. Uh, moving into the end of October, Can-Am released uh, their new quads, um, their XMR quads with a new Visco 4-lock four four-wheel drive system. So uh, speaking of the RC, uh, the RC has an upgraded uh, front diff. It has a, a, a lower um, low gear, uh, things like that, um, which a lot of mud guys love. A lot of rock crawling guys love, obviously. Uh, but in the quad market, they were kind of losing some 
some capability in that kind of like open diff scenario. So uh, the Visco 4 lock was upgraded to a version 2, which allows them on the fly uh, uh, clicking into a all-wheel drive system or a locked four-wheel drive system. So they now have in their XMRs, and the mud guys are going to love this, the a locked four-wheel drive system on the fly. And I predict that this is probably going to end up making its way into the RC cars, and you're going to see a true four-way locked diff um, which, you know, obviously would be a huge win for anybody uh, putting low gear to the to the ground. So, yeah, then that that sort of stuff is pretty exciting and very, very attractive. Uh, we just not to circle back, but we were just talking about the pro. And one of the things that kind of disturbs me about the pro, like if I had some negative criticism of it, it's it's on the fly shift characteristics like if you're in two-wheel drive and you need four-wheel drive and you flip it in on the fly my car and there might be something wrong with it i'm not sure but it won't engage you have to you have to be below about five miles you have an to hour be under five miles an hour. yep yeah and it won't do it and it it bit me once like i i, I put it in four-wheel drive before i was going up some sand uh sand hills and I had about a quarter mile drive before I went up Banshee Hill. And next thing you know, I can't make it up Banshee. Totally embarrassing. But uh, <laughs> back down Banshee, flipping a four wheel drive, went right up it. But it, uh, you know, I wasn't on paddles or anything. And I'm, I mean, I've been up, I've been up Banshee on stock tires before, but not, not with a 2,800 pound car <laughs> <laughs> with a whole bunch of people in it. And, uh, but nonetheless, yeah, if that, if there was one thing like the, the YXE, uh, the X3 to a degree, I just have a tendency to respect the X3 a little bit more. Like I don't engage it and disengage it out of two wheel drive above like 30, I'll disengage it above 35 miles an hour. But yeah, it'd be cool if that pro would, would be able to uh, engage and disengage at speed. Moving into November, we had uh, Polaris CEO Scott Wine step down. He's been there for quite a while now, and he's really been the, the foundation that's exploded growth in the uh, off-road market for Polaris. Um, and unlike the Nikola CEO stepping down, um, that was expected. This was more of an unexpected transition uh, because he's been so successful and so solid in his role. Um, and uh, But what it does do is it kind of puts an end to an era of leadership that the company had. Um, and I'm interested to see who replaces him and, and what, what their role, if it's just one of his uh, seconds or if it's somebody different. But uh, he moved off into the agriculture industry, which probably has a a bigger market as far as uh, value, but also a better retirement plan. <laughs> so um, uh, I would, I would, I'm super interested to see, you know, what happens with the Polaris uh, leadership going into 21. And uh, if there's going to be any deviation from, you know, maybe some of the strategies they've had. Uh, I don't expect that. I think they're a pretty locked down company. I think they've kind of went all in on their strategies, but um, super excited to see what the, the future holds. And I hope it, it lives up to the quality of growth that, he set the bar at. Yeah, this is all industry hearsay, but I know that Polaris has had a bit of turnover in the last 18 months, 24 months. Uh, I want to say particularly like, like in their marketing department. Right. Uh, I've never been given a reason as to why. Uh, it's just been kind of a, 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 a topic that pops up every now and again. And when he actually stepped down, there were a handful of people said that, you know, it wasn't any sort of shock. It was kind of a, a caveat of a, a culture shift at that company, but that's literally the only details I've gotten out of it. But yeah, we'll see. We'll see. It should be, it should be interesting. Um, like I said, I don't foresee, you know, something happening overnight as far as changes to the company or anything, but um, I, I'm super interested to see who takes his spot. Uh, moving on, uh, Honda released their Pioneer 520. And the reason I bring this in um, is because it replaces, it pseudo replaces their 500, which was, you know, basically their entry line into the, the utility, uh, sport utility vehicle market. Um, and the 500 redu was reduced down to 8,500 bucks at the base level. And the Pioneer 520 adds a little bit of more horsepower, uh, a newer uh, engine system. Um, and basically the same functionality, uh, but at 9,500 bucks. So you're looking at a thousand bucks difference. Uh, so I foresee the 500 dropping off the product le roster next year after they've sell sold through their parts or whatever. And um, the 520 replaces it, but it just, it puts an interesting point that you can get into a decent, um, you know, a uh, farm rig or utility rig for under 10 grand and be completely happy with it. If you've ever talked to somebody that has one of those little pioneers, uh, they tend to be an older market. 
um, but they also tend to be um, less sport oriented and they're perfectly happy with it. Uh, and then it's a Honda. It's going to it's going to be reliable. So um, great little car. Uh, good. Uh, I can't wait to see what the 520 does um, as far as market share goes. Yeah, it, it wasn't on my radar, but just you know, honestly, this is the first time hearing of it. It almost makes me kind of lend a lend to believe that it it was a com- brought out to compete against that 570 Ranger. And that little 570 Ranger, there's, I mean, I live in farm country and there's no shortage of those things running around. I, right. I probably have two or three of them within a 10 mile radius of where I'm at right now. Yeah, it just speaks to the market shift to provide more power, more features uh, at the same price levels. And uh, it's just an indicator of, of how the industry is growing. Um, so at the end of November, we came out with our annual UTV gift buying guide. Uh, it's still up on our website. We're releasing before Christmas, so you can still take the opportunity to get out and buy something for uh, your partner or family. Um, and that's at sidebysideguys.com. Uh, we got some neat little recommendations on there. So the last episode, we talked about all those. And uh, so if you need something last minute, go check it out. Uh, and then we had the sales guide, which uh, last year was kind of just a, a, a random idea that I had. Let's let's bring together all the sales uh, for the season into one place so that the community can go and, and shop um, in one place instead of being uh, inundated by ads and having to scroll through the social media feed to figure out where the best deals are. Um, and uh, last year we had some participants. This year we had an a amazing amount of response and a lot more. We had um, almost 200 deals listed on our page this year. So that was fantastic. And um, I can't wait to uh, bring those types of things to the community into 21. If you guys have ideas of how we can bring value to you by community communicating, connecting with the industry, and then providing you something in return, uh, let us know because those are the type of things that um, reward you, reward us and reward the the industry altogether as a whole. Um, and then into December, uh, we started seeing some some more leaks of information on the new Pro R coming out. Polaris's own website on their parts and accessories uh, site started listing the Pro R as compatible with certain products. Um, I found that in a Google cache and, uh, they had quickly taken it down. Um, and they had, um, since then have been working to get the cache removed from Google. So if you go look for it, it's probably not going to be there anymore, but, uh, we had the screenshots on our social and websites and, uh, it they're just probably, remo- they're probably removing it because you discovered it <laughs> <laughs> just yeah, immediately released their web it. guy probably had no clue it was there, but, um, but we found it. Yeah. There's probably somebody at Polaris marketing that sees that watches your page and basically is just like this dude. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am that skin tag that they, uh, yeah. keep itching. So <laughs> <laughs> what a terrible analogy. <laughs> um, and, uh, so anyways, it's just more proof in the pudding that the pro r is coming out and uh that we weren't uh, just some guys on the internet running our mouths <laughs> yeah i, I, I kind of wonder if i'm gonna go all junior high when that car g- does get released where you know see i told you yeah that sort of stuff yeah i'm gonna have a gift just above ready it. to go yeah. to publish oh for sure <laughs> for sure uh, yeah. And then uh, we just recently finished our uh, holiday uh, UTV wheel giveaway uh, in partnership with KMC Wheels and the Dirt Life Show. And uh, we were on the Dirt Life Show. Uh, they do it live every Monday evening. Uh, and we gave away a set of $1,000 wheels to a gentleman on Instagram. So um, those are the types of things that we love doing. We love giving back to the community. Uh, you know, it was a partnership with a brand. It wasn't out of our pocket. It wasn't out of anybody's pocket. It was just brands identifying the community as useful and uh, giving back. And I think that's awesome. And so shout out to KMC Wheels for sponsoring that. Shout out to uh, George at the Dirt Life Show for hooking us up. And uh, look forward to more partnerships like that in 21. So to wrap, wrap up the year, I just wanted to kind of just talk over maybe some trends that we're seeing. Um, and I wrote down some trends that I've noticed, but maybe you have some other ones to share with us as well, Ian. But um, I thought it was interesting to see that in, tw- in 19, uh, Can-Am was coming out with a lot of really bright, uh, aggressive colorways on their cars. Uh, we saw bright limes. We saw bright blues. We saw bright oranges. Um, and then in 20, uh, they tamed down a bit to more earthy tones and things like that. The only bright car they have is their XMR, which is a black car with some green lime highlights. 
Uh, but Polaris took the charge on that and started coming out with their uh, bright neon green lifted lime colorway and their bright neon orange colorway and then let go of it. And then Polaris take the, the lead on the bright colors. Uh, but what's even more interesting is that the Orange Madness was le- released in Mexico. It wasn't released in the States until towards the end of its life. So um, the Lifted Lime was released in North America uh, in the US only, and then is spreading out into uh, Canada and um, Mexico. So I thought it was interesting that they're starting to do, <coughs> speaking of the uh, market niche cars, they're also starting to target specific limited edition colorways to markets as well. Uh, where the bright uh, orange car was was definitely a, a favorite in Mexico, it made sense for them to launch it in Mexico. So. Um, I foresee that as time progresses, we're going to see these limited edition color uh, cars. I think they're horrible. <laughs> yeah, they're they're pretty aggressive. I would have to admit. And and the funny thing is, once you replace the cage and the springs and everything else, it's like there's now you just have an awkward fascia and an awkward trailing arm or or whatever. So um, yeah, it's an interesting I, I, strategy for sure. Yeah, I, I like black cars. Just black on black. Uh, I'm the Johnny Cash of UTV. So <laughs> I'm right there with you. Yeah. Um, and then uh, talking about uh, racing earlier in the episode, um, I foresee that racing becomes more of a marketing strategy than it has been in the past with the racers and the teams that are involved. I think that personalities like RJ and Matlocks and um, uh, the Wellers and, and people like that, that understand social media and understand being in front of a camera, becoming more and more important in their marketing strategy and their community tie-in. So I wouldn't be surprised if 2020 has a very big focus on bringing some of these racers to in front of the camera and, and communicating with the community directly. One way that they're going to do that is very similar to what we do from uh, a lot of these kind of expedition destination type trips, you know, with the uncertainty around some of the racing series, we've, we've seen some racing series slow down. We've seen some of them shut down. Um, I can tell you right now, we've gotten some messages, messages directly from some of these pinnacle race guys, pinnacle race teams that want to get involved in some of the stuff that we're doing. You know, you made a reference to uh, what are some of the trends uh, the trends are kind of very similar to what we identified at the end of last year, where more people are looking to do adventure type rides where, uh, I mean, we'll get into it a little bit later, but you know, the ride that I hosted last year initially had somewhere around 30 people commit to it. And we wound up going with about 12. The ride that we're going to do this August is double. And I really think that's going to continue, Zach. I, I think that um, I think that what we're getting into is so accessible to any enthusiast of any skill level. And I, I just think that people want to get outside. They want to see some stuff and spend some time behind the wheel of a machine that they love. Yeah. And I think that you're going to see more and more of the OEs uh, get involved with um, being a part of some of these things, right? Like you're starting to see them sponsor and push out uh, more produced media packages around going to the car or going to the race series or, you know, tune and testing and things like that. So um, if you haven't followed any of these bigger personalities on YouTube or on Facebook, Instagram, uh, go do it. They're starting to up their game and and starting to put out some really uh, entertaining content that you can binge watch and, um, you know, be along for the ride, which is, you know, what we've been saying forever is, uh, being having a camera with you and knowing how to edit and do all that, it's going to be huge going forward for your career. If you're into racing, if you're into you know any off road uh, industry where you want to be have a sponsor behind you to push you into the next level, you're going to have to be good with a camera. And a lot of these guys are starting to pay up front for filmers and editors and things like that. And it's turning into a really awesome uh, set of content to follow. Yeah, bringing out a channel. Telling your own story has been really, really popular over the last 18 months, but I think we've seen in a number of instances where people have found out that it is a full-time job. And how, <laughs> Tell me about it. Well, and they found out how what kind of an undertaking that is. And, uh, you know, YouTube year over year usually has 2 million new channels. So when you when you generate an algorithm to pick up on good content – Imagine doing that on 2 million new channels per year. So if you want your channel to be successful, you need to be posting not only good content, but you need to be posting often. Right. And uh, that's where it becomes a full-time job. And I think 
I think it kind of sorts itself out. You know what I mean? I think that uh, I, I think you see the guys that are really committed to doing this, and then you see the guys that are just like, you know, they they probably have the ability to tell a really great story, but then they see the type of time investment it takes. You know, the the rule in photography is is once you're done filming uh, and capturing B roll, fil- film forty percent more. Right. Because you'll never have enough. And uh, that sort of thing, it, it, it is a labor. No question about it. It takes a lot of work to do that. And it's a skill that you have to actually train. You have to be constantly doing it to get better. Otherwise, right. um, it'll never be to the level you want it to be. Right. Um, so to wrap up uh, that part, um, I'm also just saying, you know, as far as trends go, off-road continues its march towards mass consumer you know, market share. So UTVs had a big market, but in the general everyday, seeing your neighbors have stuff in the driveway, it hasn't been a thing. And uh, with the launch of all these new cars coming out, with trucks becoming more off-road capable, with the, um, you know, Dodge came out with their TRX to compete with the Raptor. Uh, Hummer EV is coming out, which is not just a revamp of the brand and and, and to an electric, but it's also having features for off-roading. It's having crab mode. It's having um, articulation uh, features and things like that. Um, and we're seeing it uh, migrate into video games. You know, we're starting to get off-road dedicated, UTV dedicated dedicated video games, Overpass, uh, Dirt 5, MX versus ATV are all starting to include UTVs and off-road games, right? So um, I foresee that uh, in the future, we're going to see a more and more adoption. And, um, you know, it's going to become more of a mainstream thing. And well, all that does is provide more opportunity for people to innovate and provide products and services. So if you're a go-getter out there and you and you're an entrepreneurial spirit type person, um, keep your brain cells moving because there's going to be an opportunity for a lot of people to, to get into the industry and, and thrive under this new wave of ownership. Um, so lastly, uh, in this episode, I just wanted to cover maybe some of the events and, and trips that we took this year. Um, an easy one for us to talk about would just be the takeover events. Um, you attended both uh, Grundy, uh, Virginia, and uh, Winoka, Oklahoma. You didn't go to Virginia? I did. I went to Virginia last year. Oh, last not year, okay. Twenty twenty, yeah. And uh, but you did go to Oklahoma, right? Yep. And uh, that was before COVID really kind of locked everybody down uh, too hard. It was it was in the middle of it, but uh, it was still an, uh, that would have been on. Virginia. Yeah, because Virginia got postponed out of April back, and they backed it up into the summertime. But Winoka was right during the heart of COVID. It right. was uh, September. And uh, and then we also attended uh, my first two takeovers in Coos Bay and then San Hollow um, later in the year in October. Um, so there was a lot of events canceled. We were planning to go to a lot of events this year, uh, and we only ended up really kind of attending the takeover events outside of uh, a few industry things that you took care of. Um, but uh, just a shout out to those guys. They put on an amazing show. They do a lot of work throughout the year. Um you know, as soon as the last one ends, they're starting to organize and get the next one running for next year. So, uh, you know, we we may or may not have some participation in that entire tour next year. So uh, some announcements to follow on that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's one of the I've said it a 100 times already. Takeover is one of the only events where you can go to participate. It's not go to walk the vendor row and then go ride. It's where you can participate. And uh, there's a lot of value in that. You can go out, you can never race a day in your life and go compete on the short course. Like you can go and do fun activities with the family, with the kids. Uh, There's, you know, tons of stuff that you can do as well as some pretty awesome raffles. There's some charity uh, uh, fundraising. There's um, scavenger hunts. There's all sorts of different stuff that you can participate in. You don't have to be the crazy guy at Huckfest jumping 100 plus feet. You don't have to be the guy uh, that has a $90,000 short course car. Like you can go and participate in events and participate with the community. So it's a really great time. Yeah. If there's one thing I, you know, as it relates to, uh, 2021, I think you and I kind of, we got involved in, in some stuff and, uh, time, time wise, you know, our time was always kind of a, an asset that we had to really be careful how we allocated it. Uh, you and I 
got eyes on Conconoli, Washington roughly about the same time and then collectively both agreed that we need to spend a lot more time up there. Not, <laughs> right. not, not just because of its proximity to us, but, but it's just amazing. It might be, might be Washington's best writing destination. And, uh, it's, it's just, if there's one thing I've really learned about 2021 is, uh, we just have to, I, I think that we're really going to be putting a lot of focus in on targeting our schedule to make sure that the, the stuff that we are attending, we're getting a tremendous amount of value on. Yeah. There's a, of, there's going to be a lot of uh, big hard drives purchased because we're going to be <laughs> recording a lot of content uh, in yeah. 21. So I um, mean, heck you and I've had conversation. I'll bet you within 65 days, you and I are in Conconoli sawing up trees, clearing yeah. trails. You know, I, I, I absolutely believe that. I think that uh, we got a lot of work to do. No question about it. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Um, and then you had a run. You did a trip down in Idaho after our BDRs. Uh, and I'm glossing over BDRs because I'm going to come back to it. But you did a run over in Magruder on the Magruder run uh, with a group of guys. How did that start and how did that go? It was more or less, uh, you know, I, we share adventures up on some threads and there's a lot of uh, interest in those adventures, people wanting us to share maps and, uh, essentially tell stories. So it was just kind of natural that, Hey, we're going to go ride this at this particular time. You're welcome to come along. And there's like, you're almost towing the line between having it be a sanctioned event where legalities and things like that start to come into play. And, Right now, I want nothing to do with that. I literally just want to go ride with some people that are like-minded and want to go have fun. Uh, that's kind of how that came together. And we had a bunch of people commit to it, but a core group of people, one of them uh, was based out of Seattle, but a core group of friends came uh, came to the event from the Portland area. Um, some pretty world-class wheelers, some kind of almost like Northwest, uh, very renowned Northwest people. You know, one of them's a custom machine, a custom crawler builder, and another one has won the Baja 500 before on a quad. So very, very accomplished riders. They went out with me, and uh, it it translated, it, it obviously resonated because as soon as I threw it out that we're going to be doing something similar, only on a different trail system, um, what became... Uh, you know, 20 people that were really invested in it and really were interested in going is now closer to 40 to 50 to where we're probably going to have to break the group up a little bit. But nonetheless, it's just people want to get outdoors. They want to go ride and they want to go see some cool stuff and they want to do it with competent people that they, that they feel comfortable around. And, uh, we're going to, I think that you and I are going to be doing a lot of that over the next two, 24 months, going out and guiding some of some stuff like this. And I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, there's there's so much opportunity to have amazing adventures and experiences that uh, it would be a shame for us to not try to do so. So, uh, and for 2020, you know, some of that was the Washington and the Idaho BDRs, and we've talked at nauseum about them. Um, but I just wanted to mention them; uh, they were a big part of our 2020 story, and um, you know, we've got some amazing experiences, some awesome memories, uh, some epic content to put out there. And I've been saying forever that we're going to start getting this out to you guys. Uh, I just want to make sure everyone knows that I've started editing these content pieces down. Um, I'm going to break them up into episodes. And uh, so they'll be more uh, digestible. Uh, and uh, looking forward to really telling the story and showcasing the beauty of the of the landscape that we got to, to ride on. Um, and uh, bring you guys, you know, bring that story to a close so you guys can all enjoy it. Uh, but more importantly, um, you know, this is a test run for what we're looking forward to do over the next couple of years, right? We want to do some more epic stuff and uh, involve uh, really interesting characters and, and storylines and things like that. So um, we have some things in the work. We're going to talk about some of those things in the Looking Forward episode in January. Um, but uh, just know that uh, we're working hard to get that done. Kind of a one-man show here to get that edited down. So uh, we'll get that out as soon as possible. Hopefully we can have that first uh, those first episodes coming out in January. So yeah, I've seen some guys kind of, you know, I've seen a few messages. I've seen some messages to you. Uh, people are kind of interested in when that stuff's going to release. You know, when, when you're funneling through, you know, terabytes of data, terabytes of uh, footage, it, it, Zach, Zach has no interest in just generating a GoPro clip and saying, here it is. 
you know, and when you take a terabyte worth of data that is drone footage, GoPro footage, handheld footage, probably 10 to 20 interviews that is uh, around this, this, this part of the country, uh, from a, you know, where it was that we were writing and then trying to translate that and build it into a, a, a cohesive a story. storyline. Yeah, I, exactly. That, that's where content and creating your own channel becomes a job, you know, no question about it. And, uh, I, I've seen a few people commenting they want to they want to get their hands on that footage they want to watch those videos and we're not just going to release anything man I'm just not going to release something that's just a, a a loop of GoPro footage I I don't know where you're at with this Zach but I if you know production has gotten me to hate GoPros I love <laughs> GoPros I love GoPros they're a necessary tool and they do an amazing job but GoPros expose producers right. they really do you know they they expose channels when you're when your channel is 90 percent gopro like uh, a guy like me uh, that that's mostly using like handheld stuff you know it, i just think it becomes more of a challenge to tell a unique story when you're relying on kind of i'm not going to say cheap technology or something like that but i i don't know you we we tend to we tend to do this stuff from the eye of a cinematographer and we want to I, I just think it paints a better picture when you really put that time in to capture the environment that you're writing in. Yeah. And, and that's what we're focused on is, is putting out what we want to watch and we don't want to watch GoPros. So um, no, no. You know, the easiest thing for you to do is to go watch something on, on, I don't know, Discovery, HBO, something like that. There, There's times where you do see GoPro shots, but they're mm -hmm. very rare. And it's yeah. because there's no way to stick a $10,000 camera in that spot. So yeah, you can loop in, you can loop in a GoPro clip that's mounted to the frame of your side by side. That's watching how you're actuating your foot pedals, watching what's happening in cab. But most producers that are using that footage, they're only clipping it in in little B-roll second uh, sections, two seconds at a time to give you a full paint of the picture. The majority of their best stuff is going to be done with a drone or a handheld, which takes time, which takes planning, oh, yeah. which takes editing. It's all part of the game so you know uh, you know it, what it really takes it, it takes a writing group patience you know <laughs> right. it really does because you have to set that stuff up yeah that was something we definitely learned on the bdr runs is just how to plan the next trips as far as logistics of time effort people cars uh we figured out all of our like how do we pack for the trip but we really learned on those trips how to pack for the product like what we're putting out right and so um, I think in 21, uh, one of my goals is to be more lean, mean, and efficient and to uh, get what we need and not waste our time on other things. Lean, mean, and efficient. Where, who, who's, been, uh, who's been hammering that one for the better part of a year to a year and a half? <laughs> <laughs> we've, been, we've definitely been having that on our radar, but uh, to be successful in 21, that's what we're going to have to be. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so just to wrap the episode up, I wanted to maybe throw some teasers out on what to expect over the next month or so of, of podcasts. We have a lot of stuff to talk about. We have Kawasaki launching KRX models, um, uh, and possibly some new Terex models. Uh, we have possibly a pro R release in January. We have Dakar happening. We have, um, possibly Can-Am coming to the game with a transmission. We'll find out. Um, that's the big rumor with Can-Am. Uh, electric keeps coming up. There's startup companies, Volcon, uh, things like that. I predict that hybrid's really the, the winning strategy in the next few years. Uh, so we're interested to see um, Segway come out with models in the US. They are starting to release their quads and whatnot in Europe. Uh, and so it's just a matter of time uh, as they go through the progression to get their cars out here in the US. Credit to UTV Action Mag. Something I didn't even think about at all was the possibility of seeing electric turbos come to play. So if you're not familiar with the, the performance uh, game, uh, you can have a turbo that's spun up by the exhaust and that introduces turbo lag where the power doesn't build up until you have enough exhaust pressure to give you that power boost. Um, but in the performance racing scene uh, on these drag cars and things like that, uh, they'll spin the turbos up electronically before you have to take off from the line. Um, and I totally see that as being a possibility in the next evolution of these turbo cars. Uh, you could definitely see Can-Am coming out with something like that saying, 
you know, we were at 195. Now we're at 210 and it's instant because we're spooling up before you take off. Like if we have a special, you know, sport plus plus mode um, where you can you can do launch control and, and spin the turbo up and have, you know, 200 plus horsepower at launch, right? So uh, you never know. Maybe Polaris is onto that. Maybe that's something they're looking at. But uh, it was not something I actually even thought about with the UTV scene. Um, it, it definitely is a possibility that we might be seeing that. So uh, that's something to, look, to think about um, on the next releasing, uh, release series of cars. Um, I foresee the industry getting more experiential. So there's a lot of that to talk about. And uh, there's a lot of things to talk about in 21. What's UTV to buy uh, in 21? What's uh, the possibility of maybe doing a... I wanted to do maybe a community survey, like a uh, like a March Madness bracket of, of UTVs. How would it break down if we were to put every UTV head to head? I think that would be really interesting. Um, but anyways, no, we got, that'll bring out the brand honks. <laughs> that'll that'll stir up some conversation for sure. So, anyways, yeah. those are some topics that we can look at in twenty one early in the year um, and to look forward to. Uh, but uh, I wanted to wrap up and say that this is the last podcast of the year. Uh, we're going to take the rest of the December to uh, obviously do the holiday stuff, the family stuff. But also, uh, like I said, I'm editing these um, these BDR trips. We have uh, some things developing on the calendar that we need that we're working on. Um, and so, look for the next podcast being in early January, uh, and uh, we'll kind of jumpstart the year uh, early. So, what was your highlight of 2020? My highlight of 2020, I would have to say just because of the situation that 2020 presented was getting out and riding and being at an event with people. That was my highlight. Like you, not one particular event or location, but just the opportunity to participate in what we are passionate about with the community that's passionate about it. Um, that by far brings me the most joy is, is participating in something that everybody enjoys and can get behind and um, you know get over some of the doom and gloom of the year. Yeah. Yours? I would say my highlight was uh, finishing off that Idaho run, you know, mainly because it was roughly about an 18 month process, give or take, uh, identifying that we wanted to do it and then executing it and just all the logistical challenges that came into play about pulling something like that off. And uh, those logistical challenges are going to get probably twice as hard moving forward because by all accounts, Idaho's relatively close to where we are. Washington's relatively close. So and knocking familiar. off those two trip, yeah, and knocking off those two trail systems is much more manageable. Uh, you know, I, I think I think we've spilled the beans enough. Kind of what we're going to try and tackle over the next uh, next year and a half to the next two years regarding some of those BDR trails, but uh, they're going to present much much greater uh, logistical challenges than the Idaho run did, and. Um, but yeah, that was, <clears throat> that was my highlight. That was a, that was a trip of a lifetime. Um, I would do it and again, a heartbeat. I, I absolutely thought it was amazing. I'm really happy. I'm really proud of what we did on that. But we're not starting in Yardbridge. Oh, if we do it again, <laughs> we're not starting we are in Yardbridge. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the next, uh, I will, I will see, I will see Jarbridge Nevada again in my lifetime. I definitely will. And that'll be when we tackle the Nevada run. Uh, cause the Nevada run finishes right. in garbage. And, and so I'll, I'll definitely I'm okay see with it that. again, but yeah, it, it just, it's a whole lot of nothing out there. That's for <laughs> sure. You know, we, we spent a lot of time at a very high rate of speed and a lot of wind in the desert, a hundred degrees. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's just, a lot you're of not dust. missing much by skip, by skipping out on that portion of that trail. Just last topic before we end the episode. Um, what, what kind of, uh, personalities or topics would you want to be talking about on the podcast next year, Ian? Topics for me is going to be, uh, you know, you and I beat it to death uh, in private conversation. That's features. Um, I really want to do, I, I feel like UTV has a lot of stories um, as it relates to full throttle battery. I'm doing more from the marketing standpoint and uh, UTV stories share a lot of similarities with full throttle stories. And so my task for 2021 is going to be to tell a lot of those stories. So, uh, more feature type stuff, uh, more behind the scenes type stuff. I, I really, that, that's the target. That's the target. And a lot of educational stuff. You and I were talking about it yesterday about putting out some content that would benefit the company that I work for, 
but also the industry, you know, right. uh, tutorial type videos. Uh, I'm one of the videos. I mean, there's a few things that I want to generate just kind of based on 20 years worth of knowledge in the battery business and stuff. But uh, that's that's kind of w- one of my goals for 21 and losing weight. So. <laughs> Uh, oddly enough, that's been something that I've been progressing on the weight loss uh, game too. So uh, hopefully in 21, you see a leaner, meaner uh, side by side, guys. Um, nice, nice. Yeah, I'm actually the hoodie that I'm wearing right now is a large. Wow. How about that? Nice. Uh, and so I would say that, um, you know, I've asked the community what they want to see on the podcast, and they've talked quite a bit about getting more executives on the on the show, getting more uh, team managers on the show, racers. Um, uh, people that are leading the industry in their niches and having a story to tell there, I think would be, you know, right up our alley. And so we're going to try hard to schedule those out and get those opportunities uh, brought to fruition. Um, and then I also want to get um, a lot more involved with uh, people that are, are experts in upgrades and performance things in your UTV. So, um, you know, we've talked about Evo, you know, on your car. We've talked about uh, big turbo things. We've talked about uh, wheels and tires. I, w- I want to get more experts on the show that can talk to those things. And so uh, look forward to us reaching out to those uh, brands and those companies that are, are kind of pushing our industry forward at a, on a performance level and, a, and an accessory level. So uh, if you guys have any uh, suggestions or a weird topic to talk about or just something that piques your curiosity, hit us up on our DMs, hit us up at info at sidebysideguys.com, hit us up on any of the ways you can communicate with us. Uh, we're definitely interested to know who's, uh, what you're interested in, who you want to see on the show, uh, what you prefer to listen to, um, and, and what you prefer to watch. What, what, do you, what kind of content do you want to see uh, uh, on our channel? So, um, or who do you want us to partner with so you can see things evolve with them as well? Uh, and, um, you know, what you're looking forward in 21, let us know down in the comments. And, uh, if you're on YouTube, you can, you can subscribe and, and comment there. If you're on the podcast, listening in your car, uh, visit our Facebook or Instagram pages. We're, we're active on those. We respond fairly quickly on all of those posts. And, uh, we're always looking for more information from you guys on what you want to see, what you want to hear. Uh, and we want to know what 2020 was for you. We want to know How did 2020 shape up for you? Was it a bummer year? Was it an awesome year? Are you a business? How did you guys do? Did you do good? Did you do horribly? Like, what was your story for 2020? And then what are you looking forward to in 21? So that when we have our next episode, we can talk to those points as well. Yeah, I was just going to say one thing that would really intrigue me, and you and I haven't talked about it yet, but I think maybe like once per quarter, if we did a live episode, something that was scheduled. Yeah, we've talked a little bit about doing live, right? And um, yeah, like if we shared a schedule, like we're going to go live four times per year, let it be known from a time standpoint when it's going to happen so that everybody's got a really good heads up. I think that would maximize the possible uh, potential for people engaging in real time with the show. I think that would be pretty cool. So let us know if you uh, would be up for a live episode, uh, what day of the week you would want it to be on and what time of the day. Uh, we are we're really considering taking a lot of what we do to a live platform. So, um, you know, it's going to be a lot of uh, investment on our side to make that <laughs> get pulled off with any kind of high quality. But uh, we're looking forward to that challenge. And uh, we want to interact with you guys in the community. Um, so yeah, give us some feedback, give us uh, some ideas, and we'll see what we can turn this into because we don't want it just to be two guys doing stuff. We want it to be the community driving this industry uh, as a whole. So um, this is an opportunity for you to participate and, uh, you know, change what uh what 21 looks like so long episode but it's been a long year um and there's a lot to get over left on my battery (laughs) nice (laughs) uh and so uh good timing (laughs) <laughs> looking forward to uh, regrouping in January. Uh, looking forward to Christmas time with the family um, and getting back outside and doing some things and uh, doing a lot more filming. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I got to say, we got a lot of interest and a lot of help from people throughout the year. And uh, we could we could drag that on and, and thank them. But we tend to be kind of sh- uh, face to face type people. Yeah. And uh, we can't can't wait to get out there in 2021, shake hands with a lot of people. Thank some of the people that really helped us kind of uh, steer this ship 
over the last 12 months. And uh, I mean, what are we at, Zach? We're at... Uh, this is episode 31. Six and 16, 16 months we've been doing this, roughly, give or take. Oh, roughly, yeah. 15, 15 months and uh, yeah. Hope and so, everybody has a wonderful Christmas and stuff, and it's been a it's been a ride. <laughs> yeah, and uh, another thing that I'm looking forward to is just a more uh, consistent frequency next year. Uh, I want to make sure that we can try to try to come out with a weekly podcast for everybody. We don't want to have the sporadic stuff that we've had this last end of the year. Uh, speaking again to being lean, mean, and efficient, and trying to get stuff out the door faster. So. Um, I, Stop getting sick, dude. <laughs> uh, yeah, and just getting things finished so I don't have a big backlog, right? So um, so I just wanted to do a couple shout outs before we end the episode. Uh, big thank you to Full Throttle Battery for sponsoring a lot of what we do. Uh, without you guys, obviously, uh, we wouldn't be moving across the country as frequently as we are. Um, and so full throttle, full throttle battery has been a huge partner in, in getting this community growing and off the ground. So, uh, big appreciation to them and to you, Ian. Um, and then we got guys, just tons of guys out there that we, we, that For are sure. just, I mean, there's so many of them that we can just, I, uh, we just, we need to do like an Instagram post and really just kind of end of the year Instagram <laughs> post and really just kind of celebrate the people that have helped us out. There's yep. a lot. Yeah. So, uh, this community thrives on being, um, open to sharing and willing to help and all that kind of stuff. And it's really evident over the last year, as we look back on how many people have helped us, how many people have invested into what we believe in. And, uh, so, um, I don't want to go through another hour of thank yous, but I just want everybody to know that has, that has been involved with what we do. We appreciate you. We appreciate what you've done and we look forward to opportunities to provide back that value next year and, um, looking for even more partners and people that would be willing to jump on board with what we're, what we're passionate about, uh, because we, we make what we want to watch in here. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's a, there's a big community that wants to watch and hear that too. So, um, absolutely. until the next time guys. Happy uh, f- Christmas and holidays and a happy new year. And we'll see you in 2021. Peace. Peace.